Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Rose Parker. If you know me from before, great, welcome back. If you don't know who I am, I'm best known for my Instagram page, Psychosis Sensitivity, and for my podcast by the same name. I also have a website, psychosisosativity.com, where I post essays. It's psychosis positivity with an S after the P. It's a play on the word psychosis. And this is my YouTube channel where I try and post accessible content. Today we are going to be talk talking about five behaviors that schizophrenic and other psychotic people have that can appear rude and what's actually happening behind the scenes. So as someone who's lived with schizophrenic symptoms, schizotypy my entire life, I've often had my behavior misinterpreted and assumed to be ma malicious when it is in fact not, and I am adapting to internal states that other people don't understand, they don't predict because they don't usually experience them themselves. So I hear here at Psychosis Sensitivity, one of my main goals is to educate the non-psychotic world about what it's really like to have schizophrenia and psychosis. So let's go. Number one, not making eye contact. So this is one that a lot of people with different neurodivergences have. Most famous would probably be autism, but not making eye contact. I caught a lot of flack for my inability to make eye contact with other people when I was growing up. I was often criticized by teachers, by other family members, and I was told that I looked dishonest and I was sometimes accused of lying because I couldn't make eye contact. Now, personally, making eye contact, it makes me very stressed, it can increase my paranoia, and it's not good when I'm in a particularly bad episode of paranoia or I'm in a more delusion-prone state. Um, I have chronic paranoia, a lot of people with schizophrenia do, and for someone with chronic paranoia, there might be times when we need to lessen the amount of eye contact that we make just for our well-being. So someone who's not making eye con contact with you, they're not necessarily trying to blow you off, they're not necessarily in la-la land, they're not necessarily lying to you, there might be something else going on with them that has nothing to do with you. Yeah. It just, it, 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 I find it strange how people always assume the other person's reaction is about them and not to do with something going on inside the other person. That's just, it's always boggled me how neurotypicals always assume my reactions to my internal state are about them or against them. It's like, no, it's, I'm reacting to a hallucination. Like, anyway. And I mean, they accuse us of having ideas of reference, really. Number two, leaving the lights on when you leave a room. So personally, I never really turn off the lights. When I am in a dark room, a very dark room, I see shadowy figures and other visual hallucin hallucinations, often bizarre creatures, um, pop out of the dark of the darkness at me. Um, it's very frightening and I don't like it. I sleep with a light on. I've slept with a light on for almost 10 years at this point. Um, dark rooms are a big psychosis trigger of mine and I don't like them. I will avoid having any rooms in my house dark if I can. I will avoid setting myself up to walk into a dark room if I can. And it's just, it's much safer for me this way. I won't get startled. I won't have to navigate through a dark room that I am having a bunch of hallucinations in, that I'm much more likely to injure myself in. I'm much less likely to go into a larger episode. It's simply much safer for me to be in uh, an environment that's lit all the time. I've adapted to being able to sleep in very bright environments. I can fall asleep pretty much anywhere at this point. So it's just, it's just normal for me. It bothers other people who aren't used to it that I leave lights on. It can, something I sometimes have to explain when I go over to people's houses and I, I understand it's weird so, some people, it initially annoys them from an environmental perspective, but it just, it's, it's a really 
big thing for me because those hallucinations are very vivid and very frightening and you'd probably do the same thing if you were in the same situation. So, yeah. I don't really have to experience darkness because darkness is three-dimensional for me. Number three needing to be driven everywhere so in the united states we have a big driving culture and people find it very annoying when an adult needs to be driven everywhere and you can't drive when i was 16 and i was able to learn how to drive my parents were initially very upset with me that i refused to learn how to drive i tried to explain to them that i needed to not drive and that there were reasons i couldn't but they didn't really get it Um, it eventually when I was 19 and I had my psychotic reset, the big episode that separates my adult and childhood psychosis, and I was very obviously undeniably psychotic at that point, they understood. I have constant visual hallucinations in the form of floating colors and lights that sometimes morph and change shape in front of me. And they're visible even when I close my eyes. They often get more intense in dark situations, actually. They're what some of the dark figures in the in the rooms with their lights off come from and they make it very dangerous for me to drive by the way if you hear any sound in the background it's my birds um when you have constant visual hallucinations you really shouldn't drive there's too much risk for distraction there's too much risk for mistaking the hallucination for an object in the road and it causing an accident um schizophrenia also causes a wide variety of sensory issues and my sensory issues make it too likely that i would misunderstand what was going on on the road or get overwhelmed and not be able to drive properly So, for me, driving is best for my own safety, but it's also best for the safety of other people. So, my needing to be driven everywhere is not because I'm spoiled and want to be driven or because I'm lazy and don't want to learn how to drive. It's actually just what makes the most sense logically. And people who want to give me grief about driving, well, would you want to be in the car with me? So, number four, wearing earbuds a lot. I alluded to this in the previous section, but schizophrenia causes a wide variety of sensory issues. Now, those sensory issues can be induced by hallucinations, having constant visual hallucinations. I do get overwhelmed by visual stimuli, and it can cause me things like nausea and dizziness, and I can also get overwhelmed by auditory stimuli. This can happen because of auditory hallucinations when you're hearing voices, and then there's also a lot of ambient noise. It can be too much, but schizophrenia can also be overstimulating in and of itself. It's a disorder of the central nervous system, and this can cause problems with sense with sensory processing just on its own i personally have issues with like visual snow i have issues with my eyes blurring and unblurring in different levels throughout the day i have issues with my hearing going in and out and it's just a lot to deal with and it creates a and i'm very hypersensitive to touch and i and that varies in and out in and out and Depending on how my sensory system is going in and out throughout the day, how irritated I am, how symptoms like agathisia are going, my sensory tolerance can really vary. And noise tends to be one of the biggest triggers for me in terms of secondary symptoms from sensory stimulation. Because sensory overstimulation, it can worsen agathisia, it can induce bigger hallucinatory episodes. So for me, controlling that sensory unease is really important. So earbuds are a really important way to control sensory unease for me because discordant noise, like a group of people talking, like like in a like in a crowded mall or something, is a really big trigger. So I, they're very helpful for me, and I know it can be irritating if you're like working in a store and I'm wearing earbuds, but it's a really big accessibility tool for me to even be able to exist in public to wear the earbuds a lot of the time. And if your loved one's wearing earbuds a lot of the time, I know it can be difficult, but for many schizophrenic people, listening to music is one of the only ways they can drown out the voices. And there isn't really much else you can do. 
so yeah unfortunately that's one just have to learn to live with and finally number five not responding when spoken to this this is in my case at least primarily the negative symptom allogia negative symptoms are the symptoms of schizophrenia um, that take away from normal human experience um, so it's like your fatigue your lack of pleasure um, your la lack of en lack of enjoyment lack of feeling good about the future um, and also lack of speaking or lack of emotion in speech and with, la with allergia it can be going long periods of time without talking it can not be responding to other people it can be slow to respond um, sometimes I I will have the experience where I feel like I have responded to the other person and indeed I have actually hallucinated it and heard the words projected as a thought projection hallucination and yeah so if if you're schizophrenic or psychotic loved one you speak to them and they do not respond you can try ask it repeating the question you can it might help to clarify I didn't hear a response can you re repeat that so they know they didn't say it it might jog them but it, it's pr they're probably not purposely ignoring you d d d don't 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 assume malice where the dis where the condition can explain it like cut them some slack like th 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 this is a full brain disorder this is a serious condition like th they can use some compassion and allergia is very variable for me personally i can be very chatty for part of a day and then go like almost 24 hours without talking afterwards it it just really really depends i can be normal it can be more like a normal person in terms of chattiness for a couple of days and then find it very painful to speak for the next few days it just it really varies it kind of depends on how my other symptoms are doing how much sleep i'm getting how much stress i'm under like, like everything in schizophrenia it varies with time varies with stress varies with other environmental factors um, because it is a negative symptom it's generally not as affected by medication so any psychotic medication generally doesn't affect negative symptoms very much so yeah <sighs> schizophrenic people are stigmatized based on our abnormal behavior we are treated as less than and as largely viewed as evil or potentially evil because we think differently because we see the world differently because we don't behave the same as everyone else we don't people we're almost seen as inhuman because we have a slight variation to normal patterns and it's very frustrating being a schizophrenic living in this construct and trying to navigate your life when it, when you feel you're constantly on a razor's edge is being viewed as a person or not being viewed as a person and feeling and the need to mask to hide their symptoms hide their schizophrenia is very strong for many people because of this dehumanization and i hope that by educating about what our symptoms are like and what's going on with us during them it can reduce the stigma surrounding schizophrenia and increase acceptance not just awareness but acceptance of our neurotype and all divergent neurotypes so thank you for joining me today please um, like subscribe and Join me on my other platforms, and I will see you again next time.